I am sitting here with Ted Chapin, who is the new artistic director of the 92nd Street Y Lyrics and Lyricists. We are very excited for you and for this new season. Well, thank you. I'm excited to. I'm, I have to say I'm having the time of my life. Um, I have, in the years that I've run Rodgers and Hammerstein, I've always done a talk here, a lecture there. I hosted the American Songbook at NJPAC for three years. There have always been these other things that I have done. But when this opportunity came to me, having been a longtime fan of lyrics and lyricists, I thought, you know, this could be a lot of fun. And so at the moment, I am, I am having a blast. Well, it looks like it's going to be terrific. And I mean, you're the perfect person to, to come to this because, I mean, you started as a young man with, with Follies. You want to just tell sure. us it and then wrote a book about it? Sure. Well, I, I should say that I started living on the east side. I went to school like five blocks from the 92nd Street Y, so I know that there is a thing called the Upper East Side, and it's <laughs> actually a rather cool place. Um, no, I, I grew up in New York, wanted to be part of the theater, didn't want to be a specific anything. I didn't want to be an actor, didn't want to be, I just didn't want, I didn't know what I wanted to be. I knew I wanted to be part of the theater, or as they say in Hamilton, I wanted to be in the room where it happened. Where it happened. Um, and Follies was an opportunity when I was in college. I knew Follies was happening. I had seen company. It blew me away. And I thought, I want to be around these people. So I talked everybody into letting me observe. And because it was wildly over budget at $800,000. Can you imagine? <laughs> yes. oh, with, if only that were the case today. With a four-week engagement at the Colonial Theater in Boston, no wow. less. Um, they did, because they were over budget, they did not have a production assistant. So I became the gopher on Follies. And I kept a journal every night when I went home because I wanted to get course credit at college. Uh, and had I not kept smart. that, well, had I not <laughs> kept that journal, you know, I would not have been able to write the book I wrote about it because as the years went on, Follies became a very major force in the American musical theater. And so what I had observed what the confluence, the confluence of talents at that point really provided a pretty extraordinary window into that, that part of the theater. So, so I wrote the book. It was published 13 years ago. Yesterday on the subway, a man looked up to me and said, I love your Follies book. Oh, how fun. <laughs> and then from, from there, how did they, working for the Rogers and Hammerstein uh, office come to be? Because, because my father, Skylar Chapin, was involved with a lot of great jobs in the arts in New York. He, among other f friends that they had, were Mary Rogers and her husband, Hank Gettle. Um, so they were around the house, and I just thought, oh, Mary Rogers, she wrote The Mad Show, right. which to me was like the <laughs> coolest thing of all. Um, and I, Mary came to see work I did when I ran the musical theater lab years ago. And so after Richard Rogers died, and I always like telling students this, because you never can tell when this is going to happen, the phone rang one afternoon, and Mary said, what are you doing? I think they could use you at the Rogers and Hammerstein office. Here's the number. Give them a call. Goodbye. I'll see you later. Wow. And that was 33, four years ago. Wow. Yeah. And so it was a good fit. It was clearly a good fit. It was great fun. I was, it allowed me to be involved enough in the theater, so I didn't feel as if I was just at a desk all day. But at the same time, primarily it's the management of those copyrights and try to steer them in the direction of productions that would be exciting. And you know, they didn't all, they haven't all worked out well, but for the most part, the average is pretty good. And now it's morphed into, because they were bought. Yes, the, the families, the Rogers and Hammerstein family sold it to a Dutch company, which as of July has sold it to an American company. Oh, wow, it sold again, okay. Sold again, that's once <laughs> So what's it, it was the Imagen? The Imagen, the unpronounceable name. And now uh, the, Concord, the Concord Music Group. Um, which is soon to call themselves Concord Music. Oh, that's um, easier. Yes, yeah, a lot easier. <laughs> and they're Americans, and they understand things that I think some of the, the Dutch guys didn't quite understand. Well, that's great. And that's still your day job, correct? That's still, I still, you know, by day I go down there. Yes, absolutely. Well, so now your new, My new your new play, My new play pen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, lyrics and lyricists. Um, I will confess that I was at the fifth lyrics and lyricist event ever, which was Stephen Sondheim. Wow. Um, and in those days, they were one night only, ask a lyricist to talk about being, writing lyrics. I think that's as simple as it was. Very quickly, it became um, lyricists performing their work and getting other people to perform their work. Then they ran out of lyricists after a couple of years. The audience grew, so it's now five performances over a weekend. 
And over the years, it's become examination of the American songbook in interesting and different formats. So part of what I'm steering this year is a kind of spectrum of what the American Songbook can look like and can be. Um, among other things, I did think, let's do a throwback to the early days and let's actually ask a lyricist to do an evening of lyrics. Oh, so great. Lynn Ahrens is doing it. Um, it. It will be directed by Jason Danieli, who is a wonderful actor who has really? wanted to be a director. Oh, how nice. He told me that the day he got the phone call from Lynn Ahrens about this, he had been in conversation with someone who said to him, you know, you talk like a director, you should be a director, to which he said, who's ever going to ask me? Uh, got home, phone message, How nice, ask. and Jason's lovely wife is Maren Maisie. Yes. Who's uh, an incredible singer. Yep, yep, and it's Lynn Ahrens, and Maren Maisie was in Ragtime, so right. maybe. Yeah, just maybe. Maybe well, we'll we are lucky. honoring uh, Aaron's and Flaherty at primary stages on October 16th. Where I mean, well, of course, I was a co-producer on the revival of Ragtime. I have a soft spot in my oh, heart good. for but the two of them. But you, so you've got a lot of wonderful evenings. Right. You've got a Bobby Darren evening. We're starting with the Bobby Darren evening, which is kind of interesting. The, uh, there, I happened to see a musical about Bobby Darren in Australia about a year ago. I went to see a My Fair Lady that Julie Andrews had directed. There was also a production of The Sound of Music that paid my way, but that's something else. <laughs> um, and, and I was sort of intrigued by Bobby Darren's story because it's a very interesting story. He was a songwriter, which people don't n really know. They know him as a singer primarily, but two of his big hits, Dream Lover and Splish Splash, he wrote. Wow. And he wrote 150 other songs. So the challenge about doing Bobby Darren, and Jonathan Groff is going to do the yeah. Bobby Darren material. He's and great. He's, he's, I mean, he's charming, and Bobby Darren was clearly charming, and that's what we hope to tap into. Um, but the, the, the challenge is to, is to show that, you know, as a songwriter, he belongs in lyrics and lyricists, but also as a singer, that's where he made his mark. So we're having really, really interesting conversations about how to put together an evening that gives the lyrics and lyricist audience what they're used to, but in a slightly different way. Wow. Now you've got one evening called Lenny's Lyrics. Well, it, it, in case you don't know, uh, it's Leonard Bernstein's centennial year. So yes. every time you turn around, there's either something that he wrote that was successful or something that he wasn't. And this was actually an idea that Hannah Ari Geishman at the Y came up with, with with Rob Fisher to examine the lyrics that went with Leonard Bernstein's music. And Rob has asked Amanda Green, of course, Adolph Green's daughter and a lyricist in her own right, to co-host it with him. Oh, that's fun. Oh, no, it's going to be, I think it's going to be great. I did say, because I worked on a production of Candide for which uh, uh. Leonard Bernstein wrote some lyrics himself that were, shall we say, he was a very good composer? Ah, um, that's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> but I think it would be fun to have some lyrics that, that Leonard Bernstein wrote to show that he wasn't that great a lyricist, but he, but he was from an era where, you know, if he was writing West Side Story, I mean, he started writing lyrics for West Side Story. And, you know, he just knew that if you needed them, you write them. Right. And everybody was smart enough to realize these need to be better. And, you know, that young kid, what's his name, Stephen Sondheim, he could come in and help us with the <laughs> Wasn't that nice? Yeah. I once wrote lyrics to a parody that, that I do to a downtown called Dwayne Reed because I was waiting for my friend Barry Kleinbord, whom, right. whom you know very yes. well. And he wasn't giving me anything, so I started writing my own lyrics. And that, that caused him to get on, and he wrote fantastic lyrics for me. But I don't think it ever would have happened if I didn't give him the bad lyrics. <laughs> you know, that happened with Mary Rogers with me twice. I ghost wrote something she didn't want to write. And, uh, you know, when she took my ghost written thing, she completely threw it away and did exactly what she resisted doing to begin with. Right. So, so I, so I believe but, in that. But, you know, sometimes you need that yep. little push. Yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. what? The, some of the other evenings are just, I, I guess, an Irving Berlin well, evening it, is going to be it, part yeah, of it. Yes. It is the 100th anniversary of his writing God Bless America. Oh, wow. Which he wrote for a soldier show from World War I in Long Island called Yip, Yip, Yap Hank. Um, and he didn't use it. He wrote it and stuck it in the drawer. And it was not until 1938 when Kate Smith asked for something to sing on the radio on Armistice Day, Armistice Day that made Berlin go back in the drawer, pull the song out, make some very interesting changes to the song. And wow. then she 
introduced it to the world. It became this sort of an anthem, instant anthem. And, one, and it's a part of, part of the Irving Berlin evening, because we called it Irving Berlin colon American. And part of it is to examine the kind of American he was with the possibility of asking the question, are we open to that today? You know, he came from Russia, he was an immigrant, he did not speak English, and he became America's songwriter. I mean, wow. the, you know, one of the, the premier songwriters. That's so amazing, yeah. I mean, totally. And actually, Noah Racy, who has performed in and choreographed some lyrics and lyricist, is pulling it together. He's the artistic director of it. Oh, nice. And which I think is going to be very, very interesting. And I, again, part of the fun for me is giving people like Jason Danielly and, and like Noah an opportunity to step up into a position that's, um, that they haven't done before. As you also know, it's, it's always good in this business to have somebody who's a little hungry. Yes. Have a little something to prove. You know, and, and, I, it's, and it's so exciting. Their energy is so wonderful. And, and they also will listen when I say, that maybe we should not go quite that far, but perhaps we should go over here. Well, it's like Greg Edelman, wonderful actor and wonderful singer, is also starting to direct. And he's, I've seen some terrific plays that he's directed. Yeah, I mean, if, the, if you've been an actor, who's been around for a while, actor, singer, and has probably, I mean, anybody who's been around for a while has dealt with good directors and not so good directors. And I would think that an actor has to have his own or her own um, defense mechanisms of how to deal with that. So I would imagine that's part of why a lot of actors think they could direct it, because they can certainly do better than whoever that is. And they who, certainly who, know how to work with other actors, exactly, which is nice. Exactly, and I, I mean, I believe this sounds like a cliche, but and it sort of is a cliche, but I believe in the collaboration. And anything that's musical and theater is a collaboration whether you like it or not. And if you create an atmosphere where everybody wants to work hard, it's gonna be better. It's, it's absolutely gonna be better. The conversations we're having about Bobby Darren, for example, I mean, Alex Timbers is directing oh. it. Jonathan Groff is very much part of the conversation. Andy Einhorn and Billy Stritch are the music department. Wow. And the conversations we've had have been just astonishingly creative. Well, it sounds really exciting. And yeah. you are also doing a Frank Lesser evening? Yes, David Loud, who I, I have to say, I think has done consistently among the best of the lyrics and lyricists through the years. And so he will be doing a Frank Lesser evening at the end. So in June, to wrap up the season, I understand you're doing a Frank Lesser evening. Right. Uh, David Loud, who, in my opinion, has done consistently some of the best lyrics and lyricists in the last few years, um, is going to do one based, the focus is Frank Lesser's lyrics. When I met with him about it, he pulled out a piece of sheet music of a song that Frank Lesser wrote in Hollywood called, Why Do I Always Get the Neck of the Chicken? <laughs> <laughs> to which I said, no, I've never heard of that song. And he said, you know, when Frank Lesser primarily wrote lyrics only in ho the Hollywood years, but he said there are wonderful lyrics, there are funny lyrics, and I would like to examine Frank Lesser from that standpoint, which isn't to say we won't hear the songs he wrote when he, once he came here and wrote Guys and Dolls and Most Happy Fell and How to Succeed, he wrote his own music, but there will also be a focus, primarily a focus on the lyrics. And I, think I remember be great. one song that Joe Lesser did called Balls, and it was about, you know, galas and right. dances. And, and but you know, just to hear the name, you're you're like, <laughs> right, right, really, really? No. So David's David's going to be great, I think. And and he's, you know, again, again, the 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 the, the recent history of lyrics and lyricists is very good. I mean, I'm not coming in to a situation that's in trouble which is part of the fun, is simply to take it and goose it a little bit and get it, uh, you know, open it up a little bit so that perhaps some of the uh, areas to explore and people to explore will be a little, you know, different. You know, and as I said before, you know, having Lynn Aarons, which is in some ways a throwback to the very, very beginning of lyrics and lyricists and hearing from a lyricist how, how she writes lyrics, what inspired her, which lyrics she likes, all that kind of stuff. Well, it, I'm, I'm getting very excited about this new series. And I, I actually, I am a West Sider, but I love going to the East Side to, to go to the 92nd Street. Why? Because it brings me to a new neighborhood, um, new restaurants. There's fabulous restaurants around there. So I always make a, an early dinner before you know going to the evening show or if it's an afternoon show going after. And it's, it's a fun, it's a, just a fun way to explore the Upper East Side. No, absolutely. And the Crosstown buses are actually kind of fun. Uh -huh. um, the 
other thing I would say to people who don't really go to the Upper East Side all that time, there's a really, really good and big Barnes and Noble on 86th Street between Lexington and 3rd. I hardly ever go to the Y without just venturing down, even though I live across the street from a Barnes and Noble on the west side, but that one has more. <laughs> and it had DVDs and CDs and things that you can hardly find anywhere and else. And they're, they're the ones that do the CD releases yes. there. Yes, no, it's great, it's great. No, the Upper East Side, I mean, I, I make a joke out of the fact that not enough of the Broadway people know what the Lyrics and Lyricists program. Uh, there are a lot of Broadway people who perform and are part of the Lyrics and Lyricists program. Tony Award winners and nominees up there all the time. But I just feel as if the, the more Broadway people should come to it, should know about it, um, and certainly we seem to be spreading the word. And you know, so far there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm. And now all you have to do is deliver. Exactly. Well, I think you're going to deliver. We are very excited that you're doing this, Ted, and we thank you so much. And look forward to 2018 with this new series. With this, it's a, just a new lyrics and lyricists off on on a new tangent. But it's how many years has this been going on? Yeah, the first year was 1970. Wow. Yeah. No. And it, and it's been consistently, you know, since 1970. Do the math, you know, and it's still there. And it, you know, it has a loyal audience. Uh, an opinionated audience, uh -huh. um, but th they will tell you what they like and what they don't like. Um, and I'm ready. I'm ready to hear from them. Are you going to keep the sing-along at the end? I've never been a big fan of the sing-along. Okay, just uh, we asking. Shall, we shall see. We shall. I think no. The, the, the right answer is, if it's appropriate for an evening to have a sing-along. Yes. You know, I'm not, for example, with Lynn Aarons, I'm not sure there's a song that that audience knows well enough mm -hmm. of Lynn's to do a sing-along, for example. Right. You know, and if they want to sing along with Splish Splash, I was taking a bath, then we could have a conversation. <laughs> well, sing-along or no sing-along, we wish you the very best, and we thank you for sitting and talking to us, because it's, I, I, I could sit here and talk to you for hours. I know there's a, so many stories you've got. Just have to do Got it a again. couple of more books in them, I'm sure. <laughs>